Here's a plant I can use. It's one of the dandelion like plants, the white milk sap. Uh, almost the entire thing's edible. Oh, I'll keep that. These young tender blackberry leaves. Really good too. Find my way through this. I've got an excellent chance here to get some materials to make uh, uh, tools or weapons out of. I got this tree is, is called the rain tree. And you can peel the bark off of it and make stuff like cone darts, um, uh, little bowls and stuff like that. Uh, it has a lot of other uses. You can make cordage out of it, although it isn't strong. But you can make baskets out of the bark of this rain tree. And right over there, that right there is a, a yucca. And, and that makes some of the strongest cordage. So I'm going to gather some of these. And then I'm going to try to find my way out of this woods. I can hear a highway off over there a couple miles, but that doesn't mean I can get to it from here. Uh, it could be a river or anything in the way. And there is a river between here and the highway in most spots. And there's a couple places where it crosses over bridges and it comes on this side of the the park, but yeah. let me gather this stuff up. Okay, see, got a nice strip of rain tree bark. Okay. Kind of tore that one up a little bit. I should have been a little more careful. And I've got some yucca leaves. Yes, I'm ready to keep going. And I just found this bone too. Check this out. Yep, now I'm good to go. And here's a, a broken tree. Tore off all the way up to the top. And it's got these big splinters hanging off of it. Maybe some, well, that one snapped. I was gonna say, maybe if I was careful, I'd be able to get a, a javelin off of it. Something about three, four feet long. And I think this one's a little too old. Yeah, it's just, this one's rotten. Let me find a better one. Alright, here's a stump of a pine tree that somebody cut down. And look at this here. There's razor sharp splinters all on the top of it. And that wood's good. So there's even, got them of all sizes. If I was making blowgun darts, that there would be a good one. <laughs> and so would this one. I think I'm going to hold on to those. Uh, I've got enough stuff now. I've transformed my hooded sweatshirt into a backpack so I can carry it a little bit easier. Let's get going. I just found a cane patch. Right over there. Let's go see what we can get. Yeah, see, this is perfect. These are, these are just the right size to make arrow shafts out of. And I can get the size I need and a straight enough piece that I need to make a blowgun. I'm glad I found this place. And the larger canes make good uh, canteens to store water in or uh, fruit juice. If you juice a bunch of blackberries, you can put the juice in it. Uh, you can also store uh, dehydrated food inside of them. You just get a piece of wood or bark and close the hole up and seal it with pine pitch. And those make, make perfect containers. And if you're really careful, 
you can use the, the sheath that comes off the cane you get the smaller ones and you can make uh, cones out of those for your cone darts and you just lash them with a little bit of yucca leaf and seal it up with pine pitch put two or three cactus needles in the end right there and you've got an awesome blowgun dart and here's a green briar vine nice great big top these are absolutely full of water and edible and they're really good mm. I just found some bracket funguses too there's one there one there one right there there's some way up there but they're too high for me to reach so I can I can get pine sap and use these for stoves so I'm gonna gather these and then I'll have a stove and as you can see a hooded sweatshirt makes a good backpack to keep all that stuff in and I just found a handful of orange thorns so that'll finish my darts the only thing I need now is some pine sap and I'll be able to uh, uh, hunt and cook so that'll just leave me to find something to eat and these three stones right here that I just picked up is laying right here on the ground I'm going to use to make a nice little crab maybe burn a wicket uh, and pine sap with I have a lamp yeah I'm glad I found those see just those three stones make a crab shape and you get three points of uh, three points of support for a wick and they work great well I've just made it back in from the woods and I've got my my splinters and my yucca leaves and my bark to make the cone darts out of. Of course I've got my cane here for the blowgun. I've got a slender uh, piece of cane that I'm going to use to make it the drill bit to drill this out with. And I'm going to use a piece of this bone right here to make the bit. And also on this bone is a natural hole right there that I can make a needle out of. So I'm going to try to get that too. And i got a piece of cane for my canteens I found my three stones to make a crab lamp out of and I got some bracket wick and with the bracket funguses you just carve them out like that and you put your pine sap on there and catch it on fire and they burn just like a, a little stove and they're excellent and inside of the bracket funguses sometimes you'll find these little cousins to the witchetty grove and the brackets I found today had some in there so I'm gonna eat those I'm looking forward to that I'm gonna put my uh, yellow goat's beard with it you can tell yellow goat's beard by the by the flower pods on the top they look like little dandelions and they grow in clusters and the leaves are just real skinny and sharp looking like that very much they resemble a dandelion leaf so those are good And just a few minutes out in the woods, you can gather up everything you need to uh, survive with, except for the meat. Just once I get my uh, my blowgun darts put together and my blowgun made, I'll have that too. My name is Trapper Jack Survival. Thank you for watching. But I've got my my blowgun done. See, I got the dart in there, and drilled it out. I just made a short one, something that I can hunt squirrels with. Gradually, I'll, I'll work myself into some better weapons. But just to start out with, first day out in the woods, uh, this is perfect. It didn't take me long to make it, just a few minutes, and it, uh, it works good. Yeah, whenever you hear that snap like that, you, you know they work good. This is the dart. And what I did is I took a, a, a round eye off of a, an oak tree, a, a burl. 
uh, you know, they make the round swirls. I popped one of those off with this bone right here, used it like a chisel, and uh, and then I took this part of the bone, this sharp spot, and drilled it out and made a hole in it, and uh, I used that to hold my my cone on with, so I don't have to worry about tying it or anything like that. And it's a really convenient way to make the smaller darts. And also, I got a grub and two beetle larvae. And I'm fixing to fire up this stove. I'm going to use this little, this little bracket fungus in the pine sap. And I'm going to cook these and I'm going to eat them. So I'm looking forward to that. And also, I made a couple canteens out of bamboo. Or cane. One of them I found a bobber down by the river. And the other one I had to use a piece of bark. It's a regular piece of tree bark. I just carved it so it fits in there. They still leak a little bit. You can seal them up with uh, with pine pitch, and it's not a problem. And these two canteens right here will hold a quart of water, and it doesn't really weigh much more than a normal canteen. So those are pretty good. You see, as the pine sap burns, it pours down into the little troughs that you carve in there and it holds the pine sap and it, it allows it to burn just like a stove. So all you gotta do is take your food and cook them right over the fire. Yeah, pine sap puts off a little bit of soot but it won't hurt you. It's not toxic. It's not poisonous. You can even use pine sap to make uh, chewing gum out of. So pine sap won't hurt you. And if it starts to burn a little bit low, you just add more pine uh, pitch to it. And that's all it is, just a, a bracket fungus and pine sap. And once your, uh, once your uh, food's cooked, you know, cook it and just eat them up. And just to go over my dart again. See, I've got a thorn and a little cone made out of bark, and then a piece of wood that uh, is cone shaped. It's kind of cone shaped. It's got a hole in it, and I just used a bone and a rock to shape it. Okay, put the put the cone inside the wood. Slide the thorn onto it, and shove it in there until it goes. Uh, really tight and there you have a complete dart that you don't have to tie and for cutting my bark and the, the thorns and stuff like that I use this piece of flint that I've got it's a knife that I carry with me I made this one although I found hundreds of them just laying around out in the woods They're just exactly like this nice and fat on the back side you hold the knife like this and you, you cut away from you and it's got striation lines on it I don't know if you can see them in the camera or not but there's striations in the stone they give it a serrated edge so when you cut away from you like that it, it gives you the, the best possible cutting edge from a stone and that's a really good knife but I use that to cut my bark with alright now that I got my blowgun and my canteens I think I'm going to go down to the river and try to do a little bit of hunting and uh, and, and get some water. 
uh, better not forget my knife. Uh, what kind of mushroom is this? It's one of the lactarius mushrooms. I'll have to reference that one in my book. That was a cotton roll mushroom. They're not any good. And these here. I don't know if you can see the color real good in there, but they're kind of a pale, fleshy color. Those are a non edible agricus. I'm trying to find some mushrooms to uh, go with the chicken, and I got what I'm going to cook tonight. I'm kind of wandering around here trying to find something that I can use. Maybe I'll find some. Let's take a quick walk through some Florida swamps. Yeah, it's me taking you out there. Already found a river. Look at that. Good thing there's a log there, huh? Alright. You see, even a few hundred feet away from the campsite, the forest just takes its own. So even if you're camping in the safety of a campsite, you could be just three dozen steps away from a survival situation because you get into an environment like this where you can't hear the voices of other people, you could so very easily get lost. The main thing about the Florida wetlands is you got to keep your feet dry. If you get wet, if you get wet, those socks you're wearing, Go bye bye, just like that. Once your feet get wet, and once your boots get wet, take them socks off and don't even consider wearing them. Because these things will destroy your feet. This mushroom right here, this is a red russula. And unfortunately, I can't eat it either. Oh, oh yeah, look at this right here. See these right here? Those are pig's ears. These two, I can eat. All right. And while I have an opportunity, I'm gonna pick as much of this grass seed as I can. This wild bahia grass. The, the seed is kind of like wheat. So, yeah, I can make use of that. All right, I just caught a couple little tiny minnows with this little minnow net that I made here. I'm gonna go ahead and try to catch some more. Yeah, maybe I can put together a nice soup for myself today. Well, we got a few of them that time, and they're small. They're pretty small. All you gotta do is just keep keep doing that and I'll get a bunch. If I just walk right straight down in there from this direction and try to get the, my minnows, they're all gonna swim right off down that little channel right there. So what I gotta do is I gotta walk along the bank and go down there a little ways and then go in the water and then I'll use my net and force them all back this way, back up into the shallows. And right up in here is where I'm actually gonna do most of my catching. And uh, that's going to increase my, my chances of getting the most out of every try. So I'm going to try to try to scare them all back this way. Uh, 
my minnow hunting was a success. Okay. All right. I've got this knocked over tree right here. And I lifted it up right here at a fulcrum point so that it holds it up off the ground. And I'm going to use this to hang my bucket off of so that I can cook my soup. Well, the first thing I need to do is get my grass seed ready. You got to get the seed off of the stalks. And it's easy to do. You just grab it right there by the tips. You know, with your thumb and your forefinger, you just strip the seeds off. And I put them into a little bowl or whatever I have. This time I'm using a stew pot. That's all you got to do. Just every one of them, you just strip the seeds off. Just like you would a sheaf of wheat. And it doesn't really take a long time. They come right off. It's, some of them just shake right off even. But this makes an excellent cereal grain. And you don't have wheat flour or anything like that. You don't have beans or something like that. Just use regular grass seed. That's a perfect replacement for that because it's just like wheat. It has uh, starches and protein. Alright, this is what I got so far. I got my grass seed. I got a few nice tender uh, greenbrier leaves that I found. Two bay leaves. And I found a couple beech peas. See the pea pods right there? Boy, those are going to be good. Now I'm going to chop up this gold stalk uh, bleat mushroom and throw it in there too. That's going to be good. So I'll just chop that up and toss it in. And with these, you just slice them up and drop them right in there. This one happens to be a nice bright lemon yellow. It's beautiful. No bugs in it. That was a good point. Just top that stem up. They get pithy towards the very bottom, so that part isn't too good. Yeah, um, that does look good. All right, add some lake water. It's enough to cover. Remember, I'm making a soup here. Yeah, it's ready for the pot. Uh, ready to hang over the uh, the pot's ready to hang over the stew fire. Okay, I'll bring that up to a boil, and I'll let it cook for 20 to 30 minutes, or until everything's nice and tender, and all my seed is cooked and everything. I'm gonna have a really good lunch. And also, to make a nice flavorful drink with these berries, I can just pour the water in there. I'm going to take my knife or a pine cone or whatever, and you just smash the berries in the, in the water. Just crush them all together really good. And that'll make a nice tangy, fruity, drink for me to have with my soup. If I want to change the height of my uh, pot, all I got to do is move my fulcrum point and it'll drop it down. And that enables me to set it at any height I want. I see it just simmering away. Oh, I can't wait. I'm hungry. 
me about 10 more minutes to let it cook. And it'll be, it'll be good. Don't forget to remove your bay leaves. Well, that is going to be a good meal as soon as it cools off. Mmm, smells good. I can smell the bay leaf in it. I can smell the fish. So it's going to be kind of like a cacciatore or something. It should be really good. Let me get a sip of this here. And this fruit drink. Oh, this is spectacular. Alright, let's try out that soup. Get my, uh, my chopsticks. Reach in there and see what we can find. Mmm. Bon appetit. Covered with fish. Mmm. See? Fish and grass seed. Mmm. Oh, and crushed berries taste so good and when you do it, put them in water like that. make my crushed berry drinks I just leave the berries in there and after I drink all the water I, I eat the berries too so I kind of make sure that none of the food gets wasted and then for dessert a handful of nice ripe berries and because you're eating so well out in the woods sooner or later you're gonna have to go use the bathroom so one of those things you might want to use for that is, well, what I use is I'll take a fern leaf and fold it up real nice like that. Make sure there's no pine needles in it. And I'm going to use that for TP. And if you need TP and you can't find fern leaves or you can't find soft grasses or whatever to use, you can just use deer moss. When it's moist, it's nice and soft and spongy. And it's really the perfect thing. For centuries, the acorn was a staple food of the Native Americans and other peoples around the world. And without these, a lot of those people would have never survived the winter times. Today I'm going to show you how to transform this inedible a uh, nut that's full of tannic acid into an edible food that looks very much like this dried acorn nut right here which you can then uh, grind up into a flour and make bread out of or make pancakes or anything you'd want to the first thing you gotta do is you gotta shell the nuts out what I do is I take something like a, a little piece of a oyster shell or you could use your knife if you got a knife to use. And where the cap used to be, there's a soft spot. That little circle right there is a soft spot. And what I do is I just shove it in there, and they, as you can see, they just pop right open. And you take the nut out, and well, you you got to do a double handful, or as many as you want. If you intend to make several pounds of bread out of the acorns, well, of course, you would need several pounds of uh, processed nuts to do that with. So it all depends on uh, how much effort you want to put into it and, and what you would require to use as a food. All right, I've got enough acorns for, well, this meal anyway. Uh, not really enough to make a loaf of bread, but i got enough acorns to uh, help make a meal on. And what I need to do is boil them in several changes of water. So I got to build my fire, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hang them off of my little spit right here. Uh, boil them probably uh, five times. Boil them, pour the water off. Boil them again, pour the water off. I'll do that well four or five times, and that should be sufficient. 
Okay, two green sticks and a green vine. I've got a, a, a hanger that I can adjust my water pot with. See, it's adjustable. I can raise it up to one height, or if uh, that's too high, I can drop it down. See, just hang the acorns right over the fire, my little pot. And I'll have to maintain my fire. That's why I, I just use just enough water to, to cover my, my acorns so, so it doesn't take so long to boil. And that's really all you need, just enough to cover. Four more times of doing this and uh, I'll be ready to uh, eat my acorns. And of course, if you're a fair weather camper and you have a coffee pot and a propane stove, uh, you can uh, cook your acorns like that too. But I prefer the, the traditional method, doing it over a wood fire. All right, I just took them off the fire for the, from the second boil. As you can see, the water turns brown, like brackish water. And it's because of the tannic acid. It's inside the nuts. What I'll do is I'll cover them with water again and boil them for a third time. All right, well, my acorns are done cooking. And as you can see, they've lost much of their orange color. They still have kind of like a little bit of a greenish color to them. But from this stage, uh, if I had enough of them, what I'd want to do is set them on the coals like that and let them roast until they were dry, like I did these here. Just dry them right out until they're absolutely crunchy dry. And then I could grind those up and make flour out of them. But tonight what I'm going to do, because I'm hungry, I'm just going to go ahead and eat these just the way they are. And they're fine to eat like this. And they're kind of like any other nut or, or a bean. See, all you do is just eat them right up. Mmm, really good. They have kind of a salty flavor to them. Mmm. Yeah, I'm glad I picked those up. And the thing about acorns is, if they still taste a little bitter after you've boiled them five times and you eat them and they still have a little bit of a bitter flavor, just boil them a couple more times. And that's all it takes. The smaller the acorn, the sweeter it's going to be and the less tannic acid they'll have. So great big nuts have a lot of tannic acid. Little nuts have uh, a lot less. Acorns have always been a staple food of the Native Americans. And after you eat a mess of, of these acorns, you'll understand why they like them so well. acorn flour is going to be good. I was just wandering around looking for dandelion flowers and I happened to find a lizard nest with uh, eggs in it. I take my knife and just pop a little hole in it. Oh. This one isn't any good. Yeah. See, it's all dried up. Oh well, I was going to eat that one, but maybe not. Yeah, right. In survival, any chance for food? Yep. Mm.
That actually didn't taste too bad. That lizard egg has really got me wanting some meat. I think today I'm going to try to hunt for some some of those lizards or, I don't know, some kind of meat. And even though these have already hatched out, you can still eat the casings and uh, use it as a, a source of calcium and other vitamins and minerals. Uh, now it's too late to too late to get to this nest. These, tur these turtle eggs are gone. They've all been eaten. The shells are still edible. I can I can eat the shells. Yeah, all those eggs are gone. There's a bunch of them. Here's a turtle egg that I found. You can tear it open. Oh yeah, look at that. Nice yolk inside. Yep, I'm gonna eat this one. Yum. Forging for eggs isn't a extremely popular uh, survival sport in most circles. But I certainly like it. And when you find good ones like this, uh, uh, I just find it hard to pass up. See? No, that's good. Eggs are one of the most highly prized of all foods. And when you can find them out in the wild, then you've really gotten a hold of something special. Now, I mentioned eating uh, eggshells. And if you ever have to do that, the proper way to do it is to roast the shell over a fire until it's nicely toasted, nicely brown and you put it in a grinder and you crush them up and make them as fine as you can get them nicely roasted, nicely crushed and that transforms the eggshell into something more suitable for you to eat allows you to get the vitamins and minerals and like calcium, vitamin D, vitamin A. And it allows you to use 100% of the food. And these snail eggs are the most abundant of all survival egg foods when they're available and in season. So just remember when you're foraging, there's more than just bird eggs out there. Because you got turtle eggs, snail eggs, snake eggs, alligator eggs, uh, and several others that I didn't mention. And even with uh, fish eggs, uh, all of them are extremely good food. And eggs are available from uh, late winter time all the way until uh, early summer. So there's a, lo a large span of uh, uh, opportunity for you to go out and find uh, different species of, uh, of eggs to eat. I'd like to discuss with you the common misconception between a wild garlic and a wild onion. Now a lot of people think that wild onions are uh, are these right here. See, they have like a chive structure to them. They have a nice bulb on them. But a wild onion or also known as a ramp, has a red stem, just like this. See? They have a leaf structure that's flat. They have a you know, single streak down the center of them. And they're flat like blades of grass. Now this is a, a ramp. Yeah, and this, this is not a wild onion, this is a wild garlic. And if you peel into it, if you just peel into it, 
You see? You see that clove that I just peeled off of there? Well, it's a garlic. And it has a shell on it, just like, a, just like any other clove of garlic. It has a shell on it. And you can peel that shell off, see? You can peel that shell off of there. And when you smell them, they, they smell more like a garlic and not really so much like an onion. And they're hot. They're hot like garlic it, it is. So that's, that's the difference between a ramp, which has a red stem, and a wild garlic. See, the wild garlic just has a green stem and it, it kind of looks like a green onion. It has round, round leaves on it that are hollow, kind of like a chive or some of your green onions. Yeah, it does look like a green onion, but it has the, the cloves that grow on the side of it. And the ramp, of course, has a red stem. So that's, that's the difference between the two. And while I've got you here with me, I'd like to discuss with you some of the other uh, wild foods that are available in the springtime. And one of my favorites is the violet. And I got one here to show you. See, this is a violet right here. See how they kind of droop when you turn them to the side? And it's got the streaks. Yeah, most of them are uh, uh, blue or purple in color, but some uh, uh, some of the violets have the, the purple coloration and they have uh, white petals. See, this is a blue violet here. See, all of them do the same thing. They droop like that. Yeah, these are good eating. Hmm. Another favorite wild edible of mine is prickly lettuce. This is this plant right here. If you look at it very closely, right along the back side, it has what looks like little thorns on it. And they're not thorns, they're just hairs. And a lot of people avoid this plant like it's something to stay away from. But actually it's a uh, it's pretty much like a dandelion. When you when you break it, it produces a white latex sap, just like a dandelion does. The leaves kind of look like a dandelion, and it's called prickly lettuce. And you can just eat it right off the branch, like uh, like this, when they're young and tender. Or when they get a little bit older, you can uh, you can cut them and uh, boil them like like uh, any other pot herb. Uh, so this, this is a really good food right here. A lot of people overlook it. Uh, try it sometime. This plant right, this plant right here is called yellow curly dock. And as you can see, it's got the reddish coloration to the stem. And uh, these leaves are big. You see, it's better to pick the smaller leaves like this here, but all of them, all of them have that reddish coloration to them. And this plant right here is uh, exactly like spinach. And if you like spinach, you'll love eating this right here because it tastes just like it, chews just like it, and uh, it even smells like it when you cook. Uh, this is one of my favorite plants right here, and uh, I suggest you try it too. these little pollen bulbs on, on the pine trees. Those are edible when they come out when they're small. They get woody when they get old. But if you, if you can get them when they're little tiny ones like that, like this, and get them when they're like that, they're completely edible and they even taste good. They have kind of a pine flavor to them. Let me talk about something good. What we get? This plant right here is called a spiny leaf sow thistle. And 
You can see it has the, the reddish coloration to the stems. It's uh, indicative of most of the edible plants that are out there in the wilderness. And it has yellow flowers on it. And you can cook this up just like collard greens. And uh, this is a really good plant to eat. It has a good flavor to it. And it's one of my favorite pot herbs. That's the, the spiny leaved cow thistle. And this plant right here is called plantain. See, so you get these little foxtail shaped fruits on it. Uh, you can just eat them just like that. And they got a pretty good flavor to them. There's several different species out there. And you can see the, you can see the leaves have streaks in them. See? Yeah, and that's the, the common plantain. The next plant I'd like to introduce is the dandelion. You see the leaves look like that. They have the distinctive reddish coloration on them. And of course the, the flower stems have that same reddish coloration to them. And uh, with the dandelion you can eat the, the leaves and the flowers and the roots. You can dry the root out. Um, until it's completely dry, roast it, grind it up, and make coffee out of it. And another one of my favorite plants is the wood sorrel. It has the yellow flowers on it. And of course it looks like uh, uh, a clover, you know, like a three-leaf clover. But the difference is, the difference between wood sorrel and a clover is the, the sorrel leaves are heart shaped. See, they look just like a just like a heart. And the clover the clover leaves aren't shaped like that. Although they have three leaves, and these have three leaves, the, the lemon wood sorrel has a heart shaped leaf. And it has the, the distinctive yellow flowers like that and uh, they are kind of sour and have kind of a lemony flavor to them and it's a really really good plant to eat and this plant here is a common white clover and there's purple clovers also and the flowers off of this plant are edible and they're really good I happen to like them and as you can see it has three petals on the leaves, but they're not heart shaped. So that's the difference between clover and wood sorrel. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> You have to press down? Yeah, it helps a lot better if you put a slight amount of pressure on there. You see that ember's caught real good on top of the log now. It's starting to burn into it. Yeah. And once you get it going, you'll use this, uh, this rod to actually put down on on the fire and you blow and this will this will catch on fire and that will catch on fire and it'll, you can just work it right down in there with it I mean I wonder if you just leave it will it it won't do anything no it'll just go out mm -hmm. because of getting the heat rising up off of it mm -hmm. it, it doesn't it's not going to want to burn down into it yeah. you got to force the heat into it by blowing on it You can blow it a little bit and let it rest and you know, let it work a little bit. Yeah. It's 
kind of a slow process, and you, you, you don't want to you don't want to work it with the fire too quick because it'll make your vessel crack. Okay. So you want to let the let the heat do its work and kind of work it a little you know, slow. Yeah. It'll crack whether it's wet or dry wood. Yeah, yeah. If you if you work, if you burn it too quick, it'll crack. Is this for your bed? Yeah. Your Harry Henderson bed. I'll be making canoes like this in no time. Next yeah. next weekend. <laughs> yeah, so really all you're trying to do is keep the ember burning in the log. Yeah. And once you got a, a coal seated in the log well enough, you won't need the coal anymore. So actually, you'll you'll take that uh, that plunger that you got right there, and you'll grind into the top of the log. You'll grind into it to break the break the coal that's in there loose, mm -hmm. and uh, it'll slowly just start eating the hole right down into it. You can make it as deep as you want. Amazing how hot that is. Yeah. that stick on top of it, that way the, the, the two pieces of wood will have something for the heat to interact with and your, your coal will keep burning. I'm going to take this winter crest plant, which is a wild mustard, and I'm going to process some of the seeds by roasting them and grinding them up and I'm going to, I'm going to boil these greens and I'm going to eat them. Here in a little while, I'm going to uh, demonstrate how to use a seed grinder to process uh, some of the seed stocks that are available out in the woods. And what I'm going to use today is the seed from the wild mustard, or also known as uh, creasy greens, or uh, uh, all of the field guide books uh, call it winter crest. Now, there's two ways I can prepare these seeds. And the first way is to just break the pods off of the plant. Open them up. And when I get a sufficient amount of them, I can just put them in my seed grinder and grind them up green or yellow. These turn yellow when they're completely fully ripe. Cause yeah, it's a mustard seed. Let's see, just open them up. You see the little seeds right there? 
A little mustard seeds. These seed pods are inedible. They're they're hard like wood, almost they're woody and fibrous. So you can't chew them and eat them, and you can't digest them. But the seeds inside of them are completely edible. So that's that's the food I'm going after is the the seeds. So this is going to take a little bit of work. But it's going to be well worth the effort. Okay, now that I've got a small amount of seed collected, uh, as you can see, when the seeds are completely ripe, they're a nice brown mustard. And yeah, these are still green, or they're, they're fresh. That's alright, it doesn't matter, they're still edible. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put those into my mortar and pestle. Okay, and take the pestle. And I'm going to crush them up. And that's going to release the oil from the seeds. And yeah, because they're green, they're sticking in there a little bit. I'll just scrape them out. And uh, I'm going to add this to my food tonight. And yeah, I've got a bunch more to go. Let's we'll see, that right there. There's going to be some good food. Now the second way to prepare seeds with a seed grinder is to uh, lightly roast them and of course they have to be completely dry first and then you roast them and you grind them into a powder. And I'm going to use some of these seeds here but I'm going I'm to collect some uh, brown mustards that are uh, completely ripe and which the these seed pods are uh, bright yellow, and I'm going to use those. So let's go get them. Now, I've collected the mustard seed pods. You can see how they just turn completely yellow. And what I like to do is put them into a bag, And I'll crush them up because when they turn yellow like this, uh, the seeds fall out really easy. So I'll put them in a bag or whatever I have, to wrap them up in a shirt or whatever. And I'll crush them and I'll shake it like that. And all the seed will work its way to the bottom of the bag. See when I pull it out. It just leaves the empty husks attached to the stems. And yeah, I'll do this again later after this dries out a little bit and I'll get a, a little bit more seed. Now I'm taking my shirt off. And as you can see, all these husks that broke loose. I'm going to slowly start to sift through it and the seeds will fall to the bottom and the husk will come to the top. See? And I'll shake this chaff and the, the seed will fall to the bottom. The chaff, this chaffy stuff, and you just discard it. 
get rid of it like that. And then, you got to winnow the finer chaps out of it. You can see the dust floating away, and the heavy seed falls straight down to the shirt. So I'll keep doing that, and I'll have to, I'll have to take the seed off of this shirt and shake it out real good. You see how it's got got this dust all over it. Well, I need to get that off of there because yeah, all I want when I'm done is uh, the seed. Okay. Shake it out really well. Make sure there's nothing on it. And I'll pour my seed back on there. And then I'll just winnow the chaff out of it. You can see, I pick up the seed and the fine particles of uh, chaff drift away from the seed and the seed falls directly to the cloth below. You can see the dirt left behind. Dust, chaff, and here's the seed over here, much cleaner. Yeah, still has some husk in it. And this is almost clean enough. The next thing that I'll do, because this is a wild seed stock, is I'll very closely inspect it to make sure that it's free of insects. And whether it is or isn't free of insects, uh, I'll lightly roast this seed. And that's why I like to lightly roast all of my uh, wild seed stocks, is to, to make absolutely certain that there isn't any uh, um, bugs in it or whatever. So that's the next step. Okay, I've lightly roasted my seed. Yeah, it's still a little warm. And you just want to heat them up thoroughly. You don't want to really char them. And you just want to heat it up thoroughly to make sure that uh, there's nothing crawling around in there which these seeds were really clean. I did my visual inspection I didn't see any insects, but I like to do the roasting anyway. And as you can see, some of the seeds are a nice reddish brown color and some of them are darker. So what I can do now is I can put them in my mortar and pestle a little bit at a time. I don't want to put too many of them in there at a time. And crush them up. And yeah, see how it turns a nice yellow color? Yeah, this turned out to be some really good mustard seed here. Now if I wanted to make some mustard out of this, all I'd have to do is add a couple spices to it, add some vinegar to it, add some of my whole brown mustard seed to it, and kind of cook it a little bit over a stove. Now I'd have some quality stone ground brown mustard. Well. This right here is ready to eat.
two methods of uh, using a simple seed grinder or mortar and pestle to uh, prepare seeds. And of course I've demonstrated mustard seed today, but um, literally any seed stock can be prepared with that method, including one of my other favorite seeds, which is a seed from uh, the yellow wood sorrel. Yeah, that's another one of my favorite seeds. So it's a good thing that the mangy bushman and I took the time to make the seed grinder. Uh, I was able to grind up those mustard seeds and uh, add those to my meal. And yeah, they taste really good. They're, they, uh, when they're fresh like that, they have a little bit of a hot flavor to them. And, uh, I like them a lot. So this tool right here is going to come in handy, and uh, it's something that I'll, that I'll use a lot. Yeah. I gotta get my camp ready for the night. Well, as you heard, I got rained on a little bit. But that's alright, I dropped the roof on my shelter and uh, covered up my blankets and everything. I hung them from uh, the bottom of the boat so that when the water runs in underneath, it won't uh, get my stuff wet. So that'll be okay. Yeah, and that's clever. I figured while I was waiting, I would uh, carve a utensil to eat with. I'm making a spoon right here out of pine wood. And yeah, I'm not exactly done with it yet. So yeah, I still gotta still gotta do most of the carving on the inside of it. You just got to make sure you have a really sharp knife or a really sharp stone. And it'll shave the wood off like that. And this is a piece of pine wood. I use pine to make my utensils out of because, well, I, I like the taste of pine wood. I like the, the smell of it. And it doesn't have a bad flavor to it when you, you know, eat off of it. Some woods uh, uh, really don't taste good. See, that's nigh on having a nice, sleek, slender profile. Yeah, that'll work. Alright, today I'm going to show you how to uh, um, make use of some of the roots that uh, uh, get hard in the wintertime, like burdock root and uh, chicory root. And also, uh, I'm going to show you how to uh, make use of a lot of the uh, seed plants that uh, are available this time of year like like burdock burdock has a uh, uh, handfuls of seeds in them and you got to take those out of the shells and roast them before you can eat them and uh, today I'm going to show you how to do that I'm going to use a couple different methods um, one of them is just uh, using a hot rock you know, heat a hot rock up to uh, uh, roast the seeds on and I've also got a, a small can that I'm going to use to uh, to roast some of them in. Uh, I'm going to show you how to uh, work with these materials and transform uh, just raw seeds into a, an edible food. And also, I'm going to make a, a camp coffee out of chicory. I'm going to show you how to roast the chicory roots and uh, and make coffee. Now, with burdock seeds. What you do is you gotta break the pods open, and inside, inside these little pods are the seeds. See, see the seeds right there. burdock seeds so what I'm going to do is I got a, a bunch of these pods 
I'm going to break all of them open and get the seeds out of it and uh, get rid of these husks because I can't use the husks. All I can use is the seed. And then when my, uh, my hot rock gets hot enough, once my hot rock gets hot enough, I'll uh, uh, lay them on there and roast them. But that's going to take a while, so I'm going to get these prepared while I'm waiting. And also the seeds from the staghorn sumac um, can be roasted and eaten. Eaten, but I got to uh, uh, get that little bit. Shall they cover with velvet the seeds? And what you do is uh, kind of roast them a little bit and then uh, singe the velvet off of it, and then, you, then I can uh, grind those up and eat them. So I'm going to go ahead and prepare those. And uh, while I'm waiting on my fire to get ready. Now you see the burdock seeds. All you do is uh, you break up the break up the pods. You just break up the pods, and uh, the seeds will come out of it. And of course, you may have to may have to blow the chaff away or whatever. But uh, I'm using this napkin here. And, uh, you can just kind of roll the seeds up together, and the the fluffy stuff comes up to the top. And the seeds kind of sink to the bottom. So once I get this cleaned out, there'll be a double handful of seeds here. And, uh, processing the, the burdock seed isn't really too hard. That's all you got to do is just break them up and roll them around on something and kind of separate the chaff from the seed. And see, when you're done, nothing but uh, nothing but pure pure seeds. And when my uh, when my rock gets hot enough. I'm going to roast them, and then I'm going to show you what to do with them after that. In the meantime, um, I'm going to start uh, start me some water to boil. I've got uh, my chicory root and my burdock root is uh, already uh, uh, roasted up. They only take a few minutes. So I'm going to grind up uh, chicory and burdock, and I'm going to show you how to make coffee. And for sumac seeds, what you do is... Uh, just uh, I just put them in a can, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it right over there on top of the fire and uh, roast the velvet off. Of it. So you roast that velvet off of there, um, you will be able to get to the seeds. And that's what I'm going to do. It only takes a few minutes, so I'm going to shut the camera off because I might burn these if I try to talk and do this at the same time. But I'll show them to you when I get done. All right, you see my. Uh, Sumac seeds are all nice and roasted up. They kind of turn black in there, but uh, because of the fuzz that's on them. And that velvet's edible. You don't have to worry about uh, trying to get the velvet off of there. I always just uh, roast them up really good, put them into my seed grinder, and uh, grind them up just like that and eat it. And uh, that little velvet, a little bit of velvet on there actually has uh, some good nutritional food value to it. But you, uh, you gotta kind of roast it a little bit first. So I'm gonna set these aside and wait till my burdock seeds are ready and I'm gonna grind these both together and, and eat them. Alright, with the burdock root, once it's roasted, all you really want off of it is just the bark. There's a, a thin bark on the outside and you just roast it until it's crunchy and dark and you peel that bark off of there. You just peel that off, and once you get enough of it, put it in my grinder, and I just grind it up. And then you grind up your your chicory roots. And you see, they're just uh, look like little twigs, but they're really uh, really roasted until they're, they're crunchy. So what I do is I I put that in my grinder and uh, I grind it up. Just put them in here like that. Then what you do, what I do, is I'm just going to take and uh, put that right into my boiling water.
the dock in there. I'm gonna put some more chicory root in it. Hey, we're really camping here, huh? Yeah, that's all you do. You just uh you roast and grind your chicory roots and I'm gonna let that boil for just a minute. I'm gonna pour it off into a cup and show it to you and you'll see it. It makes a really, really dark, flavorful, tasty coffee substitute that is uh caffeine free. Alright, let's pour some of this coffee right here. Let's see how we did. Oh yeah, see look here. Ooh, that's hot now. Now, now, if I had a nice white cup, you can see how dark it really is, but it's a, this makes a really, really good, dark, flavorful coffee. And it's just a roasted chicory root and roasted burdock root. Yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells good, and it really tastes good. This is an excellent way to uh, extract vitamins, minerals, and uh, uh, food value out of an other, otherwise unusable plant. Uh, burdock and chicory roots in the wintertime, uh, well, they're woody and inedible anyway, but uh, when you roast them and boil them like that, you, you get the nutrients out of it. And it's a really convenient way to uh, process foods that have uh, uh, gone in inedible. In fact, um, uh, the wild carrot, the docus carota, uh, when they get old, they uh, they turn woody. The woods, the, the, the roots turn woody. And you can uh, roast them, uh, grind them up and cook them like that and, uh, and get the vitamins and minerals out of them that way. Roots, uh, I'm going to take the stone out of the fire and uh, I'm going to put the, put the seeds on it, roast them, and then flip them off onto a uh, this leather pad here and it literally only takes a few seconds, so watch carefully. <laughs> 